All right, greetings. Hello, everyone. <laughs> greetings, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Wherever you are. Good evening. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, all right. Looks like everyone who's here is in now. Um, let's see here. Yeah, how, how is everyone doing today? We've got our special guest back in the online building, the Zoom world, the lovely, the magnificent, the wonderful <laughs> <Oprah>. Oh. <laughs> Next time I'll give you a tenner, Christoph. Thank you. <laughs> that was definitely worth a ten pound. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about IBS, also known as irritable bowel syndrome. And yeah, this is an important topic. I I always have a feeling that everyone has some degree of IBS. With all the things that we're eating, with all the processed foods, I'm like, how can you not have IBS? If you're eating a certain way, I think you must have it. But as we know, everything is on a continuum. So you're either here on the good side or you're here on the bad side. And what we will learn today is how important the gut is, um, what we can do to maintain the gut health in relation to IBS. And for those of you that tapped in last time when Audrey was there, I think it was back in the spring. Um, and it was a fantastic presentation. So if you haven't seen that one, I would strongly advise off the back of this one, go back. Um, it's on So Who's YouTube, Tai Chi Future. Yeah, so... If you miss a bit even today or next time or any anything we do, we will find it on Tai Chi Future. Um, so you can find Audra in Planet Organic and she'll hopefully be talking to you about um, her, her, her ventures. <laughs> <laughs> so she will be more accessible to the community in the future because she's too good for Planet Organic. Yeah, we know that. So we want her out of Planet Organic and we want her embedded in our community where she can help us. So um, do keep your eyes peeled, your eyes and your ears, and do support Audra when she makes her transition out of um, the hands of the, the system into the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, um, I will hand you over to Audra. Thank you so much, Christos. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here again, and we are just going to go straight in. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, because we did that other video and it was quite in depth. I'm hoping that you can refer back to it because I'm not going to cover quite as much on certain parts of the digestive system because we want to just be brief and concise and give you exactly what you need. So I'm just going to share my slide. I'm just going to close that window. Okay, so we're going to just look at briefly what is IBS. And because it's a bit of a medical diagnosis, which leads um, people down the wrong track, I'm going to share what those diagnosis criteria are. We're going to then look at some common digestive problems that you have if you're suffering with IBS, some quick tips on how to improve your gut health. I'm going to look at Things the FODMAP diet, just going to show you the foods you need to be eating if you want to take some pressure off the digestive system. And we're going to touch on some herbs and key to all of that is actually lifestyle. So a little bit about me. There. So my name is Aldra Chukikere. I am a qualified naturopathic nutritional therapist, which means I believe in the power of food as a healing modality. I'm also an educator, I used to be a primary school teacher, so I can get a little bit teachery, so um, do bear with. Um, I absolutely love nature, I think we all do, but I do celebrate nature. I think keeping that connection with nature is actually really good for our health. I'm a real food advocate, so I believe in the power of real food, nothing processed, especially the ultra processed stuff, we need to cut that out of our diets. And um, what I do, I do private consultations, I see people one-to-one, -one. I'm also a supervisor for health and body care um, in a health store that Chris has already mentioned. I'm not going to do their advertising for them. 
and advertise, um, advise on vitamins, minerals, and supplements. And I also run corporate wellness workshops. So let's get to the nitty gritty. So this is a model I use when I'm talking about gut health. So in when everything's working, this is what happens in the gut. You've got your digestion absorption. The integrity means any of the membranes are working. Um, your digestive tract has a lining and that has to be intact for it to do its purpose. The immune system is centered in the gut. So without that integrity, you allow lots of pathogens to get into the body, creating ill health. Your microbiome is integral to your gut health. It's integral when it comes to um, IBS. And we're going to look a little bit about some of the bacteria you need to be working into your life to ensure you have good gastric health. Motility is just about movement of food. So food has its ability to move through your digestive system, pushing things down and out. So anything that impacts on your motility, the microbiome or the integrity is going to have a big impact on IBS symptoms. So what is IBS? Simply, if you ever have any abdominal pain, bloating, discomfort, erratic bowel movements, it's a good chance you've got IBS, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. IBS is one of the most common um, digestive complaints, but it's often misdiagnosed, and I will explain why. So say if you go to your GP and you complain about um, having some problems with your digestive system, this is the criteria they're going to look at. It's called the Room 3 Diagnostic Criteria for Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders. Bit of a mouthful, not saying that again. But this is how they describe IBS. So if you have recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort at least three days a month over the last three months associated with two or more of the following, so improvement when you've gone to the loo, or onset with a change in the frequency of your stool. So if you're going once a day, you might go more, so two or three times a day, or you're going a bit less. And then there's a change in the appearance of your stool, which basically means either constipation or diarrhea. But this is not good enough. It does not cover at all what happens in um, IBS. The other part of it as well is that they also um, describe three different types, three different subtypes of IBS. Your type one is IBS with diarrhea. I mean, look at that. Loose stools more than 25% of the time and hard stools less than, even I'm reading that, I'm thinking, I wouldn't even know what that means. So basically you need to be keeping a food diary, um, a poop diary to see if you're having that sort of symptom. The second criteria uh, subtype is IBS with constipation. This is where you have mostly constipation and it's called IBS-C. You can also have mixed bowel movement. So it's, sometimes it's a constipation, sometimes it is diarrhea, and that's called IBSM. Actually, not that hard to work out. But therein lies the problem because when people have um, suffering with IBS, they have a whole lot more symptoms than that criteria leads us to believe. And that constellation of problems, as you can see on the screen, they don't just stop there, they impact on other systems in the body. So actually, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, impacts all aspects of one's life. So we talked about constipation as one of the signs. So when you look at that room three criteria, it doesn't really give you a good picture of what's going on in the body. The Bristol stool chart does. I shared this last time. And it's one thing you need to just print it, stick it in the back of your loo, because it's really useful for self-diagnosing what's going on in the body. A big thing in IBS is about motility, how long food is taking to travel from the mouth and popping out at the other end. And the Bristol chart explains or shows us what, what that looks like. So when there's a slow transit time, that means the food is staying in your gastrointestinal tract for a little bit too long. And what happens is when the food or the bulk of the waste gets into the lower bit of your colon, just ready to get passed out as a stool, it reabsorbs all the water. So if you're having a slow transit time, you're more likely going to be very constipated. That is an irritable bowel syndrome symptom. So one and two signify constipation. Now, on from that chart, from the room three criteria, it says how often frequency, how often you go to the loo. But it's actually different for lots of people. Some people go to the toilet three times a day and if it's well-formed, like a number four, then that's fine. Some people do 
173 days and they still have a type four stool. So the number of times you're going to the loo, that frequency of passing the bowel movement does not actually tell us anything at all around whether you're having some sort of irritable bowel syndrome or not. When there's a fast transit time, food is going through the system very quickly. So you're not absorbing any of the minerals. Um, you're also going to be losing a lot of the gut bacteria. This is another side to irritable bowel syndrome, and that is the diarrhea. So basically you're looking at number three is your ideal stool. Anything varying from that, if you can look and say, okay, you've not had enough water or you've got low in fiber, then you can actually correct it. Anything else suggests some sort of irritable bowel syndrome. So some of the things that characteristics of having um, IBS. One of them is bloating. I don't mean the regular bloating, you know, after you've eaten, you know, if you have a little bit of a stool or a fart, it all goes down and it's good as new. The abdominal pain and um, bloating in IBS is a little bit different. And on the screen are statements describing what that would look like. The really want to look at is that it feels worse after eating, or if you're stressed, you notice that that bloat keeps increasing. And the thing with bloating is that if you have um, IBS, you're more likely to be sensitive. So that bloating also comes with some sort of pain. So that's actually a good sign. If you are finding that you're starting off flat in the morning and through the day after food, you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger around the gut, that could be an IBS symptom. But there is a caveat. If your gut is just staying full and big all through the day without any changes, then you need to go and have that checked out just to rule out anything sinister. Another criteria for um, another symptom in IBS is pain, abdominal pain. And the pain in IBS is usually relieved by passing the bowel movement. But if you feel the lower left region, it's tender. That's the, your lower colon and it's worse after eating. And the thing about pain in IBS is that it can become chronic. So whenever we feel a pain, the nerves in the gut are sending a message. I think um, Sahu is gonna talk about the enteric nervous system, which is the nerves, a bundle of nerves in your stomach. There are more nerves in your gut than in your brain. And a lot of the messages travel from the brain to the gut, more travel from the brain to the gut than from, I pointed the wrong way, from the gut to the brain than from the brain to the gut, yeah? Um, and what happens in pain in IBS is that you keep sending this re repeated message of pain. And what then happens is it kind of like messes up the way we uh, become sensitive to pain. So people in IBS are hypersensitive. And in fact, research shows that they're more sensitive to heat um, in their extremities, hands and um, feet. And also pains like arthritic pain, muscle pain, headaches, migraines, because you become hypersensitive to any sort of pain. You know, pain is the way the body warns us that something is up. So it's a good thing, right? If you're in pain, you take care of it. But when that pain is insistent, it just changes how your body perceives it, making you feel much worse all of the time. So when you meet somebody, or if you are suffering from IBS, it actually doesn't stop in just the gut. So you can suffer things like, so TMJ is the temporomandular joint disorder where it hurts to chew. So you're getting aches in your jaw, sometimes difficulty in swallowing or chewing. And that can be related to IBS. You've got gastritis where you're producing way too much stomach acid and that's causing gourd. Gourd is your um, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, basically heartburn and reflux. This is all to do with something going a bit further down. But what's even more in interesting is how it impacts on our brain health. So the neurotransmitters, I think it's the statistics I saw was 65% of IBS sufferers go through periods of intense um, anxiety and depression. And because of that pain sensitivity, they can also suffer with my um, fibromyalgia. So most people with IBS don't just have the abdominal pain, they feel pain pretty much everywhere. So can you now see why if you go to the doctors and they use that room three criteria, they're going to be selling in a short straw. You're not, they're not going to get a full picture. And the other problem is because um, in conventional medicine, they treat things in singular. So if you are having say pelvic pain, you're more likely going to either lose an ovary 
or have some unnecessary operation because they don't connect to a system. Everything is treated as an individual thing. So the, the systems don't talk to one another. And if you're going with depression and anxiety, you might be given some um, serotonin SSRIs, I've not forgotten what the S stands for, um, like Prozac, you're given things like that, but actually it's happening in the gut. So using that um, room three criteria doesn't work. So it's really important that you actually know your body. You know, look at those signs I mentioned, there's some very quick signs you can see, you know, the distension in the stomach that doesn't get better or um, starts off okay in the morning, but then gets worse or births. You know, there's so many signs. And like um, Crystal said at the beginning, in our diet and our lifestyle is not helping us much either. So what are the solutions? So to achieve gut health, we need to do two things. We need to get rid of the bad bugs and we need to improve our gut bacteria. So in the gut, there's about one to 1.5 kilograms of microorganisms, which puts it as the same weight as the liver. So it's a huge organ in the gut. And what it does, it trains our immune system. It helps keep the integrity of those linings intact. These are all the things we need if we want to prevent IBS. And it's a delicate ecosystem. So it doesn't take much for the bad bacteria to overtake the good. And this is what we're going to be looking at. So there is something that lots of people with IBS will suffer and it's called small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I think I've left the bacteria off, I'm sorry. Um, and it's basically the bacteria. So most of when I talked about the microbiome, you know, the bacteria in the gut, a lot of it lives in your lower, in the colon. None of it is in, there's nothing in the stomach because you've got stomach acid, which will blitz any microorganism. And your small intestine has a little bit, but not enough. Most of your microorganisms, all that bacteria live in the colon. Now, when someone's got small intestine bacterial overgrowth, the, the clue is in the name. You've now got some micro, some of those microorganisms, mostly bacteria, traveling a bit higher up where we don't want it. And what that does, it creates an environment where food starts to get digested a little bit too early, releasing hydrogen sulfide, which then adds to that bloat. It can also be quite painful. So one of the main causes of this small intestine bacterial overgrowth is low stomach acid. And this can be for various reasons. One, if you're low in zinc, you need zinc to help you build um, hydrochloric acid. So that's a nutritional deficiency. But as we get older, we just produce less acid. The one that really I get really gripey about is the antacids. You know, you have a little bit of heartburn, you get given um, a meprazole, any of the zoles, and they reduce the stomach acid, which creates a perfect scene for this bacteria to migrate up and start to contribute to IBS. Now, trophic gastritis is basically when muscle starts to thin. So any muscle on the stomach starts to thin. And one of the major culprits is Helicobacter pylori, you know, H. pylori, which is a bacteria that causes ulcers, but it has, can contribute to IBS as well. Now, just think about it, you now got this scene where you haven't got enough stomach acid to nuke the bugs, um, you're taking antacids to make that even worse. And you've got the lining that's thinning. I mean, it's a recipe for disaster, right? On the other side, you've also got gut motility. So when we talked about gut motility is how, you know, the movement of food through your digestive tract. Now, if that slows down, which it does in age, I've already mentioned low stomach acid, food is now staying in the system a little bit too long, creating even more of the bad bacteria because they like to eat food that would be waste. So there's more of that growing and it's all pushing up and creating that perfect storm to really irritate your gut and contribute to IBS. Another one is gluten intolerance. So it is safe to say that the gluten we eat now is not the gluten or sorry in wheat that we used to eat way back when, when wheat was first grown. It has now been modified, it's higher in protein, it's been made shorter and thicker to produce a huge yield. And with that, people are developing intolerance to gluten. So a quick clue, if you eat pasta or bread or biscuits and you pretty much bloat within 20 minutes, that's actually a clue that you might be intolerant to gluten. And what that does, it slows down what's called peristalsis, the movement of food through the gut. So that comes back again. The longer your 
what food waste is staying in your system rather than being evacuated starts to actually create a scene for constipation. So gut motility is really important. Now, how long should your food stay in your gut? So the ideal is about up to between 15 and 20 hours, 24 and 48 hours. That's also a nice range. 70 is pretty much the upper limit of how long you want food to be getting through your system. So a little thing you can do, you can try eating, say a cup of cooked beetroot an hour before you eat anything else. So it doesn't get muddied up with the test you're trying to do. These are like your markers, or you can do a, some sesame seeds or a cup of sweet corn. And then you make a note of the date and time when you ate it. And then you keep an eye on your stools and notice the first time, if you have beetroot, you will actually see the color red. It doesn't look like blood, it's very much dark red. But once you see that, you make a note of the time again, and that tells you how long that food is staying in your system. You don't need too quickly, you know, like 15 hours, because then you haven't actually pulled out all the nutrients. You want to really be low 72 hours, anything over that, and you're having a problem with motility. So that's really important, because when food stays in your system too long, it starts to weaken the muscles in your gut, which means you're going to most likely get constipated. So another thing that might cause um, a growth of your bad bacteria would be food poisoning. So I don't know about you, growing up, we always left food out, you know, it'd be covered, but it didn't always go into the fridge and then we eat it later on and warm it up. Hmm, it's the perfect scene for growing these little critters. Bacteria double every few seconds. So by the time you've come back in an hour later, that food is actually not okay to eat. And there's something called your toxic cup. Right, so you can keep on eating certain things and there's not a, a problem, digestion works, you know, you're fine. Once that toxic cup is full, boom, all the problems are there. So, you know, if you're in your twenties and thirties, you think, oh yeah, I can just eat this and store it, you know, however, but that creates that scene where you then are growing a population of bad bacteria, which at some point are gonna push out the good, creating that storm. Another one is your traveler's diarrhea. So the reason I'm putting this out, this is a really good way to check if this is something happening to you. If you are starting to have some sort of symptoms of IBS, think back to when was the last time, did you have a bout of food poisoning at some point or did you get the traveler's diarrhea, um, which is from poor hygiene or contaminated water? Because that will give you a clue. And sometimes, even though you've had the food poisoning, you had it a few months ago, the IBS that comes off the back of that can happen three or four months later. So it's really important that we're taking good care when it comes to prepared food. So here's my little bad box checklist. You know, just think about, did you travel overseas? Did you have a tummy bug? You know, um, have you used antibiotics frequently? Antibiotics, like the name says, is anti-life. Biotic is life. Um, antibiotics will not only kill off the bad bacteria, it will also kill off the good, creating that storm again, where, because the bad bacteria, it's like weeds, they grow a lot quicker, <laughs> they proliferate a lot quicker than your good bacteria. But the things you can do, you can test your gut bacteria, not at the GPs, unfortunately. At the GP, they will test you for parasites, but they're not going to test you for the all the different species of bacteria, like your lactobacillus and your bifidobacterium, which you actually need. You need the bifidobacterium especially, because in most tests, IBS sufferers don't have enough of that. You can also have a test for SIBO, the small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I'm not sure why I've just dropped the bees off on all of those. So how can you improve your gut bacteria? We've covered this a lot when we did our talk in spring, so please go back to that video and have a look. But one of the easiest ways would be your probiotics, like I said. Pro for biotic life, for life. Your prebiotics is what you feed your probiotics and fermented foods, we're gonna look at a few in a minute. And we're gonna talk about peppermint oil and herbal remedies. So for your probiotics, we lose probiotic, our, our own um, good bacteria pretty much every day, just through stress, through living, through sugar, the diet, we lose a lot of our good bacteria. So it's actually quite important to put some good ones back in. Now, one that's been shown to relieve IBS symptoms is the lactobacillus plantarium, but it's very hard to find 
on its own. So this multi-strain, so this is research-based, this multi-strain with different levels of um, lactobacillus, they're the ones you use to make yogurt, and the bifidobacterium, which you have a lot of in breast milk. Um, you'll find those in these ones here. So this is my go-to if anyone's having IBS. This is the probiotics I put them on. It's 50 billion, it's a nice um, range of strains that have been proven, scientifically proven, to help with IBS. And the thing with probiotics, they're not great for everyone, you know. So for some, for some people, when you start, you might get a little bit more gas, a little bit of wind, and then it settles and you're fine. But for others, it might take a little bit of trial and error to get the one that suits. The important thing is that you don't overtake, so you take exactly what it says on the box, unless you're working with a practitioner who then can direct you. No, but for a long time, you know, science didn't actually put these two together, that bacterial health has a lot to do with all your digestive problems, but those times are over. So it talks about probiotic foods, you want your fermented foods, every single culture on this planet has a fermented food, but the ones that have been researched and shown to help with IBS is your kimchi, which is your spicy, and um, it's Korean, so it's like a sauerkraut, but it's a bit spicier, and kefir, you can get coconut water kefir, that's from the coconut milk kefir, and um, you know, for most Afro-Caribbean people, we are lactose intolerant, but kefir is actually toler tolerable should you choose to go down the dairy route. I wouldn't. Coconut, I feel, is a much better base for kefir than dairy. Now, I talked about probiotics and fermented food. You also need to eat things to feed your probiotics, and these are called your prebiotics. You've got things like Jerusalem artichoke, green bananas, onions. I mean, we quite have quite a lot of it in our cultural diet that feeds our gut bacteria. But it's really important that you feed the gut bacteria because when you're taking your probiotics, you're going to lose some every single day. So feeding them with some extra food means that you can keep your numbers up. One that's a really good herb um, to get in if you have some sort of digestive problems is your peppermint oil. Um, capsules, and you need them to be enteric coated, so like the delayed release, because if they're not, they just get broken down in the stomach and they need it to get to where you're having your problems. You really need to get it to your small intestine. This one by Viridian is really good. And research done, I think last year um, at Oxford, it showed a 65% remission in some IBS sufferers, which is actually quite impressive. So, Obviously, when you're having some of an IBS um, flare up, you've got to be really mindful of the food you eat. Now, we talk a lot about eating more fiber, but when it comes to IBS symptoms, fiber is not always the greatest thing. Um, there are some things called FODMAP, they are fructo oligo dimonosaccharides and polyols. Polyols are um, alcohol sugars that you find in, um, if you've ever heard of a rifritol or xylitol, these are all polyols. It's also in onions, but these foods, the ones that are high, so they're easily to ferment, are not great for people with IBS. So the theory is that IBS sufferers have more of the bacteria that will ferment those foods and create more gas and distension in the gut. So on here is just a quick summary. I pulled this one of interest. I didn't create this one. i um, got to give the person credit. Um, she's just talking about these are the foods you need to be eating, but I'm going to say, on here with the oils, avoid cooking with your oils because they're very inflammatory to the gut. If you've got IBS, you don't want to be creating any more inflammation in your gut. And on here, I would also say the same about tortilla chips. Mm. Ultra processed, full of junk, and you don't really want that in your diet. Now, you can see on here, gluten-based, that's a big no-no. And I think for anyone, whether you've even got IBS or not, really watch your gluten and bread intake. You know, take it down to about once every four days. Why? Because that calms any immune response. It's been shown in the labs and in research that gluten causes an inflammatory reaction in the gut for everybody. Those who are more susceptible get more damage, um, which can then lead to celiac disease. But for most of us, even a little bit of inflammation is not great. So you want to reduce your intake to about one every four days, giving your immune system a chance and time to really calm down before you then give it a bit more. 
it's hard to get away from bread, right? So I'm not going to say don't eat it, just go for, oh, hello, Moss. Um, go for sourdough, organic. That's only if you don't have IBS and you're not a celiac. Hydration. Of course, hydration is going to be really important. Hydration has been shown to actually calm the smooth muscles in the gut, calms inflammation, makes stools easier to pass. And if you are on the uh, diarrhea side of IBS, then you're actually losing a lot of your electrolytes. So you need to be hydrated. If you're on the diarrhea side, you need to actually include, you can actually make your own electrolyte drink with lemon juice, a little bit of lemon juice, some pink Himalayan salt or some Celtic salt, or some Irish moss. Irish moss is actually brilliant. That in water, boom, you have your electrolytes. So really work on keeping yourself hydrated. Because if you can think about it, dryness in the gut is just not going to be great if you are on the IBS side of things. So some herbs that really work in IBS picture are here. There's quite a few more. I'm not going to go into all of them. But ones I like a lot, the research on aloe vera has just come out and it is great for IBS. So artichoke will help you produce some bile. So what comes up in IBS picture is this poor digestion. Um, the pancreas is not producing enough of um, the digestive enzymes it needs. The liver is not making enough um, bile. So that causes a slowing down of um, digestion in the gut, setting that scene for those microbes to keep growing. You know, plants have been around for over a thousand years. We've been using herbs from time immemorial. And the thing about herbs, they have this complex weaving of bioactive compounds, which you can't get with pharmaceuticals. You know, pharmaceuticals will have one active ingredient and then loads of fillers that have absolutely no purpose in the body. So before we finish on my section, something that's really important is managing stress. I know. Stress is a big, big no-no when it comes to digestive health. You know, when you're when you're stressed, you're either not chewing your food properly, you don't actually produce enough of your digestive juices, and that slows down gut motility, creating that seed again where your bad bacteria have enough soft, they have enough food, don't they, to create a really unhealthy gut. So what can I add on here? Sleep. If you're not getting at least seven hours sleep, you know, aim for eight. That is not great for stress, um, not great for your gut. Stress will reduce the good bacteria in your gut, pushing those out, and then the bad bacteria have more of a playing field. So, you know, build into your life. Can you do some meditation? Start small. And someone's going to say, oh, I'm too busy to meditate. But there's a story about the Buddha and a businessman. Well, how they met, I'm not sure. But the story goes like this. The Buddha said, everybody needs to meditate. And this businessman says, I'm too busy. I can't meditate. I can't do 10 minutes. And the Buddha says, you need to do an hour, right? So when we sit and meditate, we're calming our nervous system. We're choosing effective practices for how we be and the foods that we choose and the things that we do. So it's really important that you're calming that nervous system because there is a gut brain axis, which I was going to talk a bit about later. And stress has this power to not only upset the balance of good to bad bacteria in the gut, that then translates into not having that good connection between the gut and the brain. And then you're having like high cortisol, which is also bad for the gut. So it's just like this, you know, lose lose cycle. So honestly, building into your life some level of stress reduction is brilliant for IBS. And that's kind of like it. Thank you. Much quicker than last time. So those are my details. And um, at the end, we'll talk about how, um, if you'd like to work with me, um, I'll be all here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was really, really good. Really good. You know, um, a lot of the things you were saying, it kind of, you know, resonates a lot with personal experience as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, you know, when, when you get into a stage where you're really reflective about, you know, who you are, how your body is, how yeah. your body changes, you know, a lot of what you're, what you're saying is, you know, you just have to really be acute and really be in that reflective mode to understand. 
And it was interesting, you know, the Buddha and the businessman, because I feel that this is probably one of the first lessons that we should really be aware of, you know. And when you're in that forever meditative state, it kind of makes, puts you in a position, especially depending on your body type as well. Because, you know, with the different body types, you get one body type, which is kind of, it's able to accumulate more waste accumulate more toxins and sometimes when it gets to that stage people are maybe not so sensitive where they're more susceptible to bigger problems yes yeah. so they okay. might get you know the cancers and stuff like that and then sometimes you can get other body types which will show things much more quicker you know so i remember my my grandma um, well my mum always says about our great grandmother, and she was saying actually that no one can poison us. <laughs> and I feel what she was really saying is that actually, how how our body reacts, it reacts a little bit quicker in the sense where you you know get more of an outbreak or you get the headache a lot quicker. And just from that analogy and kind of that experience, you I. I've witnessed how all these different things and even practicing with different types of diets mm -hmm. or practicing with different types of meditations and stuff, how if the sleep is not right, mm -hmm. the, you know, just the ability to get rid of toxins, you know, and you can almost feel like within myself an accumulation of toxins that, if I miss sleep and then let's say I catch up on a power nap, even a power nap, I can feel the system changing and getting rid of, you yeah. know, the toxin through the sweat and stuff like that. Because each body part has its own biological clock. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. When, we, when we lose that on one, it impacts on all the rest. You know, yeah. that's, that's why what you do works so well, isn't it? Because you don't sleep. It affects your food choices, your cortisol levels to up, you're more likely to be stressed, you then react poorly, and because you reacted poorly, you then put yourself in a state of guilt, which is a negative emotion, and it just it, it's just a cycle, you just can't get off the, the pedal. So and sleep, I, for me, sleep is actually crucial. Because yeah. I you know I hear people, I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta do more, I gotta do more. And that mm -hmm. is do do less, but do it effectively. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, we're, we're all guilty of <laughs> some way of neglect. And, but you know, even when we're looking at the Chinese system and the body clock, yes, how every, every part of the body is kind of a little bit more alert. Mm. And I think this is the real importance of observation. And if we, <laughs> we, don't, we don't really observe and we just go through what we hear and what we learn, then we're, we're never really going to get the, the full picture. Mm. Um, and even... I want to say to clients, you know, you are still your own best doctor. Mm. If you pay attention, you can hear and feel. The body talks to us all the time, doesn't it? But we just mm. have to be quiet and not buy into pharmaceuticals to sort everything. You know, the mm. solutions to most of our health issues lie within us, but we need to be quiet to hear it. Yeah. And then you can feel it. You know, when you're looking at, for example, even just irritable bowel syndrome and even the order of eating, you know, when you even observe that, if it's interesting because, you know, when you hear parents say to the child, you know, make your, eat your food first before the dessert, I mean, even the order and the way the order of food processes mm -hmm. through your body. Yeah. yeah. You when you're eating certain food, which is good, you, you, you're buffering your, your belly, you're lining up your belly in a certain way where all the good bacteria can thrive and eat. Mm. And then even if you eat something which is not so great after the good food, it still is beneficial in the sense of you get that buffering effect. Whereas mm -hmm. if you eat that sugary stuff before the good food, you, you see how it can mess up your whole, you know, Mm. way of eating so yeah no that that was really good thank you thank yeah. you
Yeah. I think what Jamie was just saying, I just raised it. Jason, Jamie was saying he's done the beetroot thing. <laughs> I just wondered how long his transit time was. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here, Jamie. <laughs> That can go through quick. Yes, Audra, that was a that was a powerful presentation. Oh, thanks. I, there I was something I was wondering as well. You know, with the um, with the fruits, because you know, you were with the irritable bowel syndrome and avoiding stuff like blueberries, um, melon, peaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some people. So some even people. with fruits, for some people, it's just saying if you have IBS. There's some foods you want to just pay attention to. So if you react to those, take them out of your diet till you're in remission, till you're healed. It's not the same for everyone. I've had a bout of IBS and I was fine with blueberries, but I definitely, I still now cannot eat melon. Okay, I, I, exactly. I get sick if I eat melon. Yeah. yeah. That's not an IBS. Yeah. Because from your presentation, it's quite clear that irritable bowel syndrome is a thing that um, happens to us quite frequently. And we're not yeah. um, labeling it this way. We're calling it oh, this is an upset um, tummy, or yeah. not too well, and they're not observing the cycle of it in a month. The yeah. same happened in a certain pattern as you mm -hmm. described so well. To know that, wow! So it has made me even, um, and it's deep to say that it doesn't matter if you're frequently going poo during the day anyway, because it all depends upon the type. So you know, some people think, yeah, I ain't got no irritable because I'm always going to toilet, so I'm good. I go tell it in the morning, and it's like the argument's finished, and yet yeah, I have discomfort still. So yeah, look at the quality of the still. The quality tells us more than how often you go. Yeah, yeah. all that coming together to just really um bring a lot of clarity to I think to people's general perception. Yeah, and you can go into remission. It's just that thing of recognizing because what we do as humans, I think we're conditioned from an early age. Oh, you're all right. You know, you've got the uncle. There's an uncle that always farts. And we go, yeah, that's fine. And we've got the uncle who's always belching. And we just accept these things as normal. They're yeah. not. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I'm always saying, no, oh, help. And we just, <laughs> that's God. fine. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a grandma who's got a bit of bad breath. And we're like, oh, grandma, you know, just don't, don't kiss her. <laughs> <laughs> but she's always been this way. We just put up with this stuff. And then yeah. we wonder why down the road we get arthritis and all these chronic diseases of inflammation and diabetes you know it's <laughs> jamie said he doesn't remember the time just going to see what he says oh that's a shame but i think a well, it's a few hours, hours. Good, you, good you say three out three days You're yeah you can go up to three days but up to 72 hours is the upper limit of normal you, you know by 72 i'll be questioning how good your digestion's going but it's still within the normal range. But you know, there are people who don't go for 240 hours, 10 yeah. days. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Days. That is that's the thing. Anything to get that bowel movement going. But as we know now, it's yes. almost about having a consistent type of stool. Yeah. A stool that looks um, yeah. And like a, a sausage. <laughs> and yeah. smooth. 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 And you need to talk about poo, like every, you know. Like this is me and my kids, you know. I'm like, oh, tell me about your poop. You know, train train our young people. There's so much information in there like before you go to the GP. Mm. But there's but there's never been question just throwing out there though. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have urine therapy. Yes. Yeah. So has there been like a feces therapy? There is a fecal one, and that is actually been shown with IBS, where they've taken. Um, stools from a healthy subject, so good balance of gut bacteria. It's been put in the capsule and they've given it to somebody with IBS and they've gone into remission. So, yeah, there is fecal therapy. Okay. okay. A bit smelly though. <laughs> never, yeah, never come across that one there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, they're starting to do um, transfer. Yeah. What's the word? What's the T word? Oh. Put things to somebody else. Transplants, fecal transplants, that's what they call them. Yeah. Because oh, that's okay. to do with the um, bacteria, isn't it? Of, let's say, a healthy gut. Yeah. Matter mm. And insert it in someone's gut, which is not so healthy. Yeah. And that feces colonizes the uh, yeah. unhealthy person. Because yeah, they've done it the other way as well, where they've even your, so your gut bacteria decides 
how you store weight, how you store excess food, or people who are anxious, and they've done it where they've taken gut bacteria from someone who's anxious and then changed it, and they've got they've been fine. You know, I mean, they do a lot of it on mice first. I don't, I don't like talking about them because it's always done on mice first. But you know, the, the the gut microbiome is an organ in itself. It's a complete organ, so you can actually move that from person to person mm. if you get the good stuff. Yeah, that has cured seem to cure some of these um, autoimmune diseases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny, humans. We are so creative. And I always think, why do we have all these wars and things? We are amazing at thinking of the, I mean, who would think that you can transplant feces, <laughs> right? Well, and get problem. those healthy results. Yeah. And then that science there is um, not, not generalized through the population. No. Yeah. So then people aren't seeing hair in this one here. I mean, a lot of us are hearing of coronic irrigation. Yeah. Pulling the stuff out. Yeah. But then not restoring it though. And that's a problem. In fact, that's a problem with colonic um people are taking stuff out, like you said, and they're not putting the bacteria back in. They're not looking at their diet. You know, mm -hmm. we, we like a quick fix. That's you right. Know? We like a quick fix, you know. So there's nothing wrong with colonics, but you do you know it's a cycle. You need to put the bacteria back in before you flush some of because when you do a colonic, your good stuff goes out as well. Okay, so then we have um, the option of actually using some kind of capsule or something to insert. Or is it, yeah, do we have the option also of, of um, it would, is there digesting? No, I think it goes up the other way. Yeah, because you don't yeah. want, unless it's enterically coated, it might end up opening where you don't want it and then sticking your small intestine. And you need to get, the, um, as you say, to the, um, to the large intestines. That's where you want it. So up that way, that's it where, where it's needed. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And as you said at the end, it's all about um, becoming stress-free, relaxing, exercise. Yeah, just managing stress. You know, there's always going to be stress. This is how we deal with it. It's what we say to ourselves when we're being stressed. You know, these are the things, you know, look at your circle of influence. Sometimes we get too stressed about things that are completely outside of our control. Well, bring your attention or focus to what's what's within your remit to influence. That's right. I, mean, I learned the hard way because I used to put my energy all the way out there and mm, just bringing it back. Well, that's the stuff that I want to go and lead into. The same stuff that you, um, you, you ended with, so it was perfect. So I don't know if there's any other questions going on. Uh, looks like there's not much question that, that everyone's just appreciating the presentation, it seems. All right then. Well, I think we're going to um, continue with, our, with the presentation. And thank you very much, Audra. So we're going to go into continue with what Audra was talking about with the gut health, because we've gone through and have a, a really good clarity on the amount of situations that cause problems to the gut, or should I say? That when we're observing ourselves in a week, over two weeks, over a month, the frequency of gut irritation or um, inability to pass your, your stool properly or the inconsistency of your stool. So we're looking at how to maintain this health. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through some of the major systems that are involved in this and um, find ways to, to work with them. So as we're aware with this irritable bowel syndrome, these are the, the basic things that are going on. Stomach upset, we get pain, bloating, and we know now it's not no normal type of bloating, diarrhea, constipation, so general bowel problems. And we're gonna go into in a few moments, this, this emotional shift between uh, mind and gut, but this seems to be a tremendous factor involved in irritable bowel syndrome. So when we have our um, issues going on, our eating habits can be slightly out of alignment and as a result of experiencing trauma, anxiety, depression, um, mental health issues, any of these kind of situations here. 
we start to generally um, eat inconsistently or not eat at all. So we're going to one extreme or the other. And we leave straight from the middle. So let's say we start under eating and then we have less activity going on. So the, the area becomes spasmodic and restricted and tight. And let's say we overeat, then the area becomes expanded, but still restricted and tight. Peristalsis in both cases is inefficient. So when it comes to um, eating habits, a lot of this comes from our emotional intelligence, our ability to, with our minds, break, break a cycle of thought. So we experience a situation and it causes us anxiety or stress and we think about it. But let's say we don't think about it. And in this case, what happens when we don't think about the incidents that took place or the trauma that has happened. The trauma could have been when you were a child or the trauma could have been last night. Whether the trauma was um, a few moments ago. Just a few words said what you heard. Yeah, these subtleties, when we, when we miss the ability to think about it internally and disconnect and have no emotional attachment to it, this is what is regarded as our high emotional intelligence. When we have this ability here, then it doesn't impact onto our dietary pattern. It doesn't shift our moods and our feelings. And then we don't start um, shifting and binging, for example. So emotional intelligence is one of the most important key factors in resolving and balancing the gut. And it all stems from what we call introspection. When we're looking at the lower dantian, we're looking at um, that space. So let's, let's say in yoga, we're looking at the, um, the navel chakra in this space here, you're looking at judgment or, or um, the ability to release as an emotional concept or an understanding. So it's the inability to let go. All that stuff there is held in that space. So we have three systems that are connected and interwoven through the whole process of having irritable guts. This is happening frequently during the week, in a month. And we're aware of the, um, of the brain involvement through thought and thinking, but we're gonna expand upon that in a few moments. And then we have our um, gut and belly activity, sorry, um, stomach activity. And we, I'm gonna go into that a little bit as well. The idea that, Within the small intestines, you have all the neurons and all this information, what we call our intuition, our gut feeling. That's not even housed within the space that is known as the colon or the large intestines. We're looking at the central space there, where we're thinking about this idea of our, of our um, intuition or gut feeling. So we have neurons spread through that whole system. Also, we have the heart. So we have a heart and mind connection, and we have a heart and gut connection. We've got a gut and mind connection. We've got a gut and heart connection, mind and heart, and all three systems, vagus nerve connected. So really, there's this one major nerve, and all this other stuff going on, but there's one major nerve that is really interacting through these different systems here that control and balance our emotions. Look at the simplicity of that. We've got three major areas and three major systems and one major nerve. And that one major nerve can be controlled through your breath. Yeah? Imagine this now, through your breath. The heart can be tempered, can be controlled, calm down through deep breathing. Your belly can be soothed and eased through breathing through the right part of your abdominal area. 
and your mind can be calmed through deep breathing. So you've got these three brains that are interacted, interacting together, and when they're upset, they just go all out of control. So therefore, it means the vagus nerve is no longer in a parasympathetic state, let's say. It's, it's been um, irritated, so it's going to a sympathetic state, stimulating the nerve. So in, in, with neurons, we have connections that are wired up within the gut, heart, and brain. And the space there can come, become congested through um, edema, fluids, but also irritated. But the beautiful thing is, when everything is functioning and is moving correctly, it's like you see a symphony of wonders take place. So here is an example, actually, of two neurons coming together. Let's see this. What you're looking at here are two neurons under the microscope that I've filmed. And if you wait really patiently, you'll be able to see them connecting to one another. Magic. What you're looking at here. So we have, when everything is functioning normally and everything is functioning, we have our neurons that are in our gut area. This is how they're operating. They're just extending out, moving through the space that's around us. But imagine the space becomes viscous or thick or dense, or there's an irritation. This movement is impaired. It's such a, a subtlety. Movements. Although slow, it's very precise. So that means they're stretching out and connecting to each other, communicating. So that is how neurons connect. So last time we spoke about um, electrogenic bacteria, and I was looking for something to describe it, and I found myself describing it in a useful manner. So we're just going to review this, because it's all about creating space. Bacteria start to form in the gut space. They start to make these lovely lines, and then these lines here, and this is these are food particles, what they're showing here. So after they've made their lines of bacteria connecting to each other, as they start to move, they start to latch on to food particles. This is what they're showing that they found in their research. They found that there are bacteria through earth, in the soil, in water, deep in the ocean bottom. They do very similar things. They make these lines. They connect together and they make electrical grids. Some of them are able to power. So now they're looking into utilizing these bacteria like to um, give energy to mobile phone and these things. Are. But if we go back into our own body, these are the things that are happening that we're unaware of. So if we're looking at it from the point of view of healthy gut bacteria, because I'm sure that at some stage you're going to find that all bacteria, all bacteria are creating, um, are creating voltage, are creating electricity. So as we said, so when, when it's, so it's about electricity and when everything is functioning and there's space and there's no irritation, we can create voltage and electricity. Our thoughts create electricity. Our emotions create electricity. Lights we receive frequency and through our body. But if the space is irritated, so then what is the main way to maintain uh, a balanced and stable space? Because it's, it's beyond just food itself. So we have three natural ways to kickstart. They're like ha hacking, hijacking the system. It's like um, when there is issues going on, we have to keep these systems in check. And the three systems are the limbic system, 
the enteric system, and the endocannabinoid system. These three systems here are the key systems that we talk, what we've been talking about um, when we talk about irritable bowel syndrome or we talk about any of these issues that's going on. It's these systems here that are the ones that are coming online and that are irritated. So we are, um, so we're going to look, just in two minutes, briefly, what the limbic system is, where it's situated, and how it impacts us. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the limbic system. The word limbic comes from the Latin limbus, which means border. And the limbic system was given this name because its structures lie along a horseshoe-shaped area of cortex that appears to be a border between the cerebral cortex and the subcortical structures of the diencephalon. There are many processes associated with the limbic system, but the system is most frequently linked to emotion. There is no consensus on the structures that are considered a part of the limbic system, and some argue that it is too much of a simplification to consider something as complex as emotion to be handled by one group of brain structures. Regardless, these are some structures that are often included in the limbic system. The amygdala is an almond-shaped collection of nuclei found in the temporal lobe that seems to be especially involved with fearful and anxious emotions. The so we've got the amygdala, fearful and anxious emotions. And the amygdala really is one of the major areas that is affected when it comes to our emotions. And it's a space that all of these areas but this amygdala especially is a space which we can cycle our emotions within and disconnect ourselves from our prefrontal lobe. So we've got the amygdala. The hippocampus is next to and interconnected with the amygdala. Although it is considered part of the limbic system, the hippocampus is generally associated with memory more so than emotion. The parahippocampus... Oh, did I you? So... As you said, that's more to do with memory, the um, hippocampus. So when the amygdala, and then because um, it's so close, the ne neurons and that, when we have emotional experiences that are, that are triggered in our memory, we experience the recalling of these memories. It appears to be a border between the cerebral encephalon. There are many processes but the system is most frequently linked to emotion. All right. There is no consensus, on, and some argue that it is too emotion to be handled by one group of brain structures. Regardless, these are some structures that are often included in the limbic system. A shaped collection of nuclei found in the temporal lobe that seems to be especially involved with fearful and anxious emotions. The amygdala? The hippocampus is next to and interconnected with the amygdala. The Although it is considered part of the limbic system, the hippocampus is generally associated with memory more so than emotion. The parahippocampal gyrus is an area of cortex that surrounds the hippocampus and also plays a role in memory. The cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus is well, one of the corpus important. callosum and is involved in various aspects of emotion and memory. The septal nuclei have connections with a number of other limbic structures and are thought to be especially important to pleasure, reward, and More bonus information here. reinforcement. The mammillary bodies are two groups of nuclei that are involved in memory and have extensive connections with the amygdala and hippocampus. The fornix is a fiber bundle that carries information from the hippocampus to the mammillary bodies and then onto the thalamus. The hypothalamus controls hormone release via the anterior pituitary and can exert widespread influence over bodily states to maintain homeostasis. But here we are looking at the limbic system, the major areas. And these system here can take over from the prefrontal cortex where we make our decisions and our um, rationale thoughts. This is why humans have such a big prefrontal cortex. But once that becomes inhibited with our emotions, like it, gets, it becomes disconnected. So this prefrontal cortex matures in the human about 25 years old. But we call this our alpha power because with concentration and thought, meditation and breathing, you take um, 15 minutes out in a day, 15 minutes and focus on your breath. This allows you to enter into an alpha brainwave state. And that frequency allows your 
whole brain wave pattern to align to a prefrontal cortex brain wave, let's say. So as a result, we have all these wonderful experiences. We have empathy, insights. We are able to be flexible. Uh, emotions are easily regulated. Body, mortality, intuition. We are able to communicate. And our fear is modulated, so we're able to reason this out. When this limbic system takes over, though, yeah, we're just going to fight or flight, or you're just going to, am I safe? Um, what I think people thinking around me, a lot of insecure thoughts. So when it comes to irritable bowel syndrome, this is why it, our gut seems to be more irritated than we take for, than we are um, assuming initially. So these thoughts are played within our society. You can watch a movie and experience the same sensations of thoughts reflecting upon your own life experience. And as a result, trigger that emotional response in your gut, in your body, and just fire up the whole process. So we want to activate this prefrontal cortex. So as we move into the next system that's involved in this process here, which is the entric system, so we've got this gut brain connection going on. We have the entry system is a separate system from the so we've got the nervous system where we go to the peripheral nerves, we divide them, and that goes to somatic, somatic and autonomic um, cells that are peripheral through the body that are that can be regulated. So you can access them yourself, you can activate that part of your nervous system. And then you have autonomic, where you can actually, so somatic would be like muscles and that stuff there, connected to muscle fibers. And then you have automatic, where stuff is happening without your involvement. Your, your breath is controlled by both systems. You have two pathways in the brain that activate this stuff here. So then from the autonomic, we got the sympathetic and parasympathetic, where we're talking about this vagus nerve. And then from that now, from the autonomic nervous system, we have the entric system, which is separate. So we have these three divisions coming from the autonomic nervous system, which is coming via the peripheral nerves, which is coming through the central nervous system, the spinal cord. Via the spinal cord, the roots coming out, then the nerves coming out from the roots. And then some of them nerves are automatic and some of them aren't. So part of the second brain in your gut. Yeah. So it's going to uh, uh, a nice overview of this connection now between these two. Now we have a, a deeper clarity just on the system itself, appreciating the separateness, but the connection of the nervous system. Here's a look at what the enteric nervous system, ENS, is. The second brain is believed to contain some 100 million neurons more than in either the spinal cord or the peripheral nervous system, sheaths of which are embedded in the walls of the long tube of our gut or elementary canal running from the esophagus to the rectum. Equipped with its own reflexes and senses, the second brain handles digestion, including the contraction and relaxation of intestinal muscles as well as the absorption of food. It is also capable of inflicting the occasional nervous pang. Ever felt butterflies in your stomach? The ENS contains 90% more serotonin and 50% more dopamine compared to the brain and its peripheral nervous system. The second brain can operate autonomously without being directed by the central nervous system, but it is not the seat of any conscious thoughts or decision making. While mental disorders like anxiety and depression are known to cause issues with digestion and the gastrointestinal system, recent studies have found that the connection between the gut and the brain may also trigger big emotional shifts in people enduring irritable bowel syndrome and functional bowel problems such as constipation, diarrhea, bloating, pain, and stomach ache. So the little brain in our innards in connection with the big one in our skulls partly determines our mental state and plays key roles in certain diseases throughout the body such as the neurodegenerative Parkinson's disease. And compared to men, women reportedly have a higher risk of vulnerability to illnesses arising from ENS disorders. And this could be um, one of the reasons as well why a lot of women experience more fibromyalgia 
because once these symptoms of irritable bowel or bloating or dis or discomfort in the gut takes place and it affecting the mind, the brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, intercepting logical and intelligent thought from the prefrontal lobe. So that's the entric system as we understand this now. So now we're gonna look where, how these two work together. How the gut and the brain communicate has fascinated us for centuries. The gut-brain axis transforms information via the vagus nerve from food to feelings. Once eaten... From food to feelings. Yeah? I love the way I do that. How the gut and the brain communicate has fascinated us for centuries. The gut-brain axis transforms information via the vagus nerve from food to feelings. Once eaten, digested food particles enter the small intestine, which is covered with a velvety layer of villi. Each villus is lined with a single layer of epithelium. This layer is made up of different cell types. One of them, the enteroendocrine cell, is unlike the others. It is our gut sensor. In addition to communicating through hormones, we discovered that enteroendocrine cells also synapse with nerves, including the vagus nerve. We call those enteroendocrine cells synapsing with nerves neuropod cells. They sense and react to their environment. They sense mechanical, thermal, and chemical stimuli such as nutrients or bacterial byproducts in the gut lumen. Inside neuropod cells, signals from stimuli are converted into tiny electrical pulses. These pulses propagate via synapses onto the afferent neuron of the vagus nerve. Vagal neurons carry the sensory information to the brainstem, linking the signals generated inside the small intestine to the brain. The neuropod cell connection with the vagus nerve serves as a conduit for food in the gut to influence brain function within seconds. This connection is also a potential portal for gut pathogens to access the brain. This new knowledge is a foundation for designing therapies to treat disorders related to altered gut-brain signaling. It's all about electrons and electricity so we've got this entric system and brain um limbic system connection going on the chemistry from the brain affecting the gut and then the gut affecting the actual brain itself and this is the, the gut brain axis all controlled via the vagus nerve so we practice deep breathing just randomly you're walking down the road you just turn your head and you see the tree waving all of a sudden, probably waving at you anyway. And you just acknowledge that and you breathe that in for a moment. And you just observe the ambient, the energy around that space there, like you're looking and you're not looking simultaneously. You take four deep breaths in, then you decide to take another five. Once you've done all of that stuff there, a couple of minutes have passed, it's like you've interfered with this vagus nerve and automatically, or ir irritation going on, generally starts to calm down and subside, unless you have to do it for a little longer. So this, this, the power resides within us. But we also have another system, which is a knock-on effect. Or oh, you do that breathing stuff. Um, you pay attention to your diet by eating certain food. Then there are experiences that we go through. So this is another two minutes. So back in the 80s, researchers wanted to know how THC worked. In T so back in the 80s, researchers wanted to know how THC worked. And THC is a plant-made cannabinoid or phytocannabinoid found in cannabis. And it's just so this is how we come to understand how the endocannabinoid system does what it does. And we're looking at this from the point of view, not of necessary THC and um, the other oils, the other options there. We're looking at it from the point of view that you exercise and move and breathe. You activate this system here. 
Let's check out what she says about this. Responsible for the intoxicating and euphorogenic properties that cannabis is so infamous for. And using radio tag THC, the endocannabinoid system was discovered as THC locked into and unveiled this extensive receptor network concentrated throughout the brain and throughout the rest of the body. And THC did this because they found out it's a direct analog or mimicker of our own endocannabinoid anandamide. And as an aside, anandamide, also known as the bliss molecule, is what's really responsible for the runner's high, not endorphins. Anandamide. That is what we're looking at here. Anandamide, so when we're doing our exercises, doing something we really enjoy, we're breathing deeply, we start to produce anandamide, the bliss molecule. Right? So if you, any of you have ever experienced the euphoria that's come with exercising, that's your endocannabinoid system, that's anandamide. And we're finding more each day about over 100 other phytocannabinoids found in cannabis and other plants that mimic our endocannabinoids and have the potential to supplement or, meet, or modulate the endocannabinoid system in therapeutic and healing ways. So this is where we're at. We have this incredibly mind-blowing system, and we have this plant, y'all, a plant that works on this system in therapeutic and healing ways. So what I really hope you're wondering right now is what's wrong with that? All right, well, the answer lies within the annals of American medical history, starting with two guys who really wanted to sell a lot of prescription drugs. And in their heyday, at the turn of the 20th century, American medicine was based on homeopathy and herbal medicine, and naturopaths and chiropractors weren't getting down with patent drugs. So with the millions of dollars in their pocketbook, a document called the Flexner Report, and the full force of state governments, American medical training was consolidated and standardized in accordance with pharmaceutical drug science to the exclusion of holistic care practices, natural substances and remedies, and natural cures. So this is the reason why we have something as simple as the irritable bowel syndrome plaguing us to such a degree, because um, early turn of the early um, 1900s, all those processes were inhibited, even within the field that I practice when I was training to become an osteopath, although I never finished that training there because I hit a barrier in realization of how it changed from its original teaching. So it became much more mechanicalized from where there was resolving fever, um, pancreas issues, um, high blood pressure, looking at these kind of things too, just went to resolving a back issue. So she just broke down that we have within our gut space, these receptors, and these receptors help to balance out these um, sensations, inflammation, if the inter intestines itself are not moving as well as they should be, so it's inflamed. We have these receptors in there which respond to the the um, cannabinoids, and this can be stimulated through exercise, through movement, through going for a walk, going for a stroll, going to the pool for a swim, doing yoga, pilates, tai chi. There is so many options, even down to golf, um, cricket, tennis, knitting, all those stuff there. We do that, but we'd be taken away from that a little bit and operate in a nine to five and we live in this light deprived reality. So we be getting taken away from that a little bit and experiencing a little bit more stress and strain. But the beauty of this system here, when we understand kind metrics, is the ability to alleviate pain. So even if one is unable in the moment to find a dietary resolution, there is a resolution directly in your pharmacy, in your body, that you can activate. This is what we call now anandamide or bliss. We are irritated and stressed, or irritated, let's say more so. How can you find any bliss or inner calm? And the beauty of this is that it switches from the pain, the ache, the discomfort, all the way to the inner calm, inner tranquility. So this is the last slide here. And this is just an approach that is um, utilized in uh, resolving 
So imagine this approach here. And you watch this, you see that it's being done to somebody. But this is what you can do to yourself. I refer to myself as a GI psychologist. That really is my focus. And I have a unique understanding of the psychosocial components of uh, chronic GI conditions. There are only a handful of health psychologists around the country that are specializing in this area. And Loyola is really unique in that uh, we were able to offer this, this service as one component of our digestive health program. So it's been a pleasure to work with Mrs. Kopecki. She's had a long history of irritable bowel syndrome, causing really uncomfortable digestive symptoms. I was really afraid to even go out sometimes. My belly was hurting me so bad that I'm like, well, what if this happens? I can't go on vacation because I'll be in the hotel room sick the whole time. And she had tried many different approaches to get her symptoms under control and um, really hadn't been able to find any lasting relief. And so we took a different approach to helping address her IBS by using gut-directed hypnosis. That relaxation flows into your stomach, even deep within your gut. Your stomach and intestines can feel so well. This involves a deep talking to yourself, talking to your guts, having that personal connection. This is the power that we hold within. Level of relaxation and focused mental attention, and then utilizes guided imagery and suggestions specifically targeting gut sensitivity and stress sensitivity in the body. And so, this is a technique that I utilize with patients in the session, and then help them to learn uh, on their own as a strategy they can they can implement to um, manage their symptoms long term. And after meeting with her and going through some hypnosis and practicing the hypnosis she gave me, I felt 100% better. One of the reasons I really love what I do and I'm very passionate about it is because approaching IBS from a behavioral standpoint seems to be very effective, especially for patients that have failed other approaches. And the reason is that these behavioral treatments can target brain-gut communication. And a lot of the re latest research coming out indicates that it's this miscommunication between the brain and the gut that's really contributing to hypersensitivity and these chronic uh, uncomfortable symptoms. Stress level affects IBS and I think that's the number one reason why the hypnotherapy really works because it is like meditation. I'll notice when there's more chaos going on in my life, that's when I turn to it more. And she really had very impressive results. She still does have intermittent symptoms, but uh, they're much less severe. The flare-ups are much, much less frequent. And I think overall, she just feels more able to control and manage the symptoms than she really ever has before in her life. There it is there, you heard it from the um, professional, as we say. As you heard from the professionals, the power's in your hand, it's in your mind, connection through breath and control and relaxation. Wow, <laughs> that, that was phenomenal. Yeah, that was really, really good. I mean, the more you see the research and look at all these emerging stuff, the more you realize that, you know, our, our body is just. Oh, but all the answers are ready. And mm. we've been chasing, we're chasing, um, yeah, going around chasing, and it's right in mm. front of us. Because even your the um, slide where I, f I forgot the name now, um, it's not the THC, it's mm. the substance that the body produces. Oh, the anandamide. The anandamide, yes. And you know, you realize that, okay, <laughs> you don't really have to be taking marijuana or all of these things to be on a natural high. Yeah, you, no, that's true. You can just, whatever, you, I mean, because all these um, substances are being, basically, they're replicating what's in the body anyway. You know, the dopamine, 
you know, it's replicated in the body through experience. The yeah. anandamide replacing the THC, but there's so many other examples and so many other things. Even when we were talking about the red light therapy, we could see that the sun yeah. is replacing all of these other external things that are making us feel a certain way. It's true. Because that would and, the same endocannabinoid system. That feel good feeling when the sun touches you and you smile from within. Yeah, yeah. And it just makes you realize that this intern is the internal experience. And I suppose this is where the alchemy lies, you know. This is where we're looking at the, the real water into wine. You know, when we're trying to change these things outside of ourselves or gravitate to these things. You know, they, they seem very distant from us. You Water know, wine, you know, it's fermentation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And we, we, all that process is happening within the body. True. It, it, it reminds me of the Matrix, where the oracles say to Neo to bend the spoon. <laughs> and Neo's like, oh, I'm trying to bend the spoon. And the oracles are like, be the spoon. And then when way. Soon. <laughs> he was able to bend it. Yeah. For, yeah. What, what did he say? You have to bend uh, yourself. That's what he said. You have to bend yourself or something. Don't try to bend your, the spoon or something. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was re definitely in relation to self. Mm, mm, mm. And that is yeah. it. You know? Yeah. It's the inner alchemy that we're trying to, um, to regulate and regulate through controlling our thought. But mm. we come to find constantly that breath is this <clears throat> in scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that slide where, you know, it, it, the vagus nerve, how, you, you know, a lot of the time when we're looking at in an isolated way, we're looking at what the vagus nerve does. But then when we're looking at it in a very practical, holistic way, you know, then we're realizing, oh, actually, yeah, the, the brain the heart, the gut, and then the vagus nerve, and then through the breath. We got. A, we need a good middle man or middle person. <laughs> I swear we always need a middle person, and the, the vagus nerve is the middle person in this scenario here. The tree control, um, um, supported by the one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that vagus nerve. Is extremely um extremely busy nerve. And when you even look at um this is how deep that nerve goes then, because you know they talk about um the wandering nerve, but in mythology, that nerve there always connects me to um Walden, mm -hmm. the, the the wanderer. Walden the wanderer. Walden, um, what's that? Um Walden is Zeus. Yeah. Is it Zeus? No, hold on. Which one's for is um um Olden. Sorry, Olden. Oh Olden. Olden. Sorry, Olden. <laughs> so then <laughs> Walden is Olden and Olden is the all father, the all seer, the, the overseer of everything. Hmm. So then you can so we can just connect in even old stories. I reckon it's connected to the same thing, where we have the All Father, the one that sits at the top. The vagus nerve starts at the top, and it travels through the whole body, through the through the various realms, and you can say the seven realms, because Odin, um, through Midgard, sorry, from from Asgard, yeah, you have the um, you have Yggdrasil, you have Yggdrasil, which is the world tree. And this world tree here, which um, Olden travels through, he travels through the world tree to stop at a different. So you got Midgard, which is you could say the gut, but it's like where Earth is, the earthly stuff. And he travels through, and there's a lot of nerve dispersing from the vagus nerve through the gut itself, all the way to the to um, to the beneath. But then it's really going to Olden's story. And then the whole idea at, the, at the, the top, or we could say the bottom, where he loses an eye. 
through staring at the water. The waters, the waters now, I don't know how I just go into this one here. The waters being like cerebral spinal fluids mm -hmm. going on. So, mythology, I know I go through that swiftly. There always seems to be some kind of connection unless I can just make this stuff up. But <laughs> I feel like saying, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> because the story is just, is, is just rewritten, it's just written. And we just, as time goes on, we just unfold in layers to the story. This vagus nerve has been extremely important from ancient times. And I think it was relayed as so as its importance through um through olden story. And then four, being the one that is sent forward, the defender is all about electricity. Mm -hmm. You need to do work. You need to go out and do your work, man. You need to earn your worth. And that's through activity and movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the the slide on the the nerve. The connection of the nerve. That was an interesting one in the sense of because when we're dealing with um, a lot of our automatic tendencies, let's just say that, mm. what we gravitate to, you know, we can see that there's a system that's been in place to make us behave in a certain way through the food choices, yeah. through, uh, you know, the nutritional deficit and through the co colonization of bacteria, which, like, you know, like the aliens <laughs> that take over our system. And then you, you just look at how people act outside and you see they're slaves to their flesh. That's right. Yeah. And we see the degradation of society, you know, based on a certain pattern and a way of living. And that's why it is very important to, you know, be careful what we're consuming, you know. Yeah. In our um, and then at the same time, you see, you know, when you're looking at maybe, I, I mean, I haven't done the full research, but this is just by observation. But when you look at the way certain people are eating, I mean, you've never heard of a person eating a very holistic diet and then going out to cause atrocities out there. Depend what you call an atrocity, isn't it? Well, it, it, that, it does depend, but, you know, the, the, the crime, the, the general crime out there. Yeah. You yeah. know, when you look at the, the population... Yeah. You know, we, we know that certain foods that are being consumed or certain places that seem to infiltrate our, you know, our communities. It's true. You know, we can see that eating certain foods, certain bacteria is probably even created <laughs> and put into foods. But and then we see... Intelligence. They have an yeah, intelligence and... to replicate. Mm. And the fear. Yeah. The fear yeah. that's been produced when we're eating certain foods mm -hmm. and then the reaction. Whereas you see other environments and you see sometimes how the children are behaving in the environments where none of these things are even possible. Not to say that they're not acting a certain way on their, their other drugs. <laughs> yeah, and they may be experiencing other stresses in their environment which they may re uh, require a deviating from. Mm -hmm. You know, Vanessa asked a question there about um, other foods. And for those scenarios, um, herbs are pretty good. Oils are pretty good. And you can ingest, get ingestible oil or um, boil or use an infuser. But let's say we're going to ingest it, then to boil chamomile, um, lavender, rosemary. All these ones are really good and also found to stimulate the endocannabinoid system. So those are good options of herbs to use. Um, food that calm the mind. I would say food that are, are, are which are um, calming. So that's mm -hmm. like making cucumber juice or something. You got any other suggestions on food there? 
I would say food that just really help us to repair. You know, we're going through so much stress. And, you know, in both Sahu's presentation and Audrey's presentation, you could see how stress is such a big thing. Yeah. You know, so we, we need to that repair the brain from the stress. And this is where some mushrooms are good. Things like lion's mane seems to be quite good in just helping reconfigure the brain. Um, and then anything that will make us rest. So oh. that can be like the passion flowers and stuff like that. Things that will just allow us to get to sleep. You know, the chamomile tea, as so you were saying. And then kind of maintaining that behavior because. Not a one off. Yeah, when we're seeing the connections that we saw the slide with the connections of the synapse, you know, these connections are happening for good or for bad. So naturally, most of us are coming from the connection from the bad because, you know, if we've been given a certain diet, when we was young, you know, over time it's so easy to that to be our predisposed norm. So whatever we do to counteract that, there has to be a level of consistency. Hmm. You know, some will say 21 days, some will say 90 days, but whatever that number is, that's what we need to do. It is really that consistency, which is going to build up the synaptic connection. Because not only do the synapses connect when we're forming new habits, but they also get a little bit bigger. You, you can see the actual nerve connections kind of getting bigger and stronger. And when we've achieved a good habit in that direction, then it becomes second nature. Then our reality is eating well. There's no other way. Mm -hmm. You know. This is a month or so to get the, the groundworks. Of yeah. the, um, plasticity or yeah, and that's just the groundwork isn't it <laughs> one month you know but the thing is it's one month every day can't really take a break here and that's mm -hmm. if we're looking at that pattern but that's our Lalela Africa late great Lalela Africa would say there are many different cycles we can have mm -hmm. a cycle that's um, every three days that we do something every two weeks we do something every month once a year he made mm -hmm. reference to that as an addiction, that you can have an addiction to alcohol and only <coughs> drink alcohol every two years, but that's just your addiction, <laughs> where, you, where your cycle is, or you can be drinking um, every weekend. That's just your cycle. If you don't drink, then you're just not, you're just not in that cycle. But every your cycle is, it may just be, that's how, the, yeah. So it's being aware of cycles, your own cycle, your own rhythm. Mm -hmm. and then, for example, you can, um, if, if, if you have anxiety free a situation, you're aware of that, have a nice relaxing bath the night before. Mm -hmm. And you can have in this bath, chamomile, same rosemary. You can put them into a, a stocking or something, into a, a sock. Because yeah. chamomile, you need to put that into something. Because the thing will just block up your sink. But you need to put it into something and um, you can place that on your head, on your belly. It's the whole, um, the whole, we have to go buy that. You can buy that from Brixton. What's that place there? Whole Foods in Brixton? Yeah, yeah, Whole Foods in Brixton. You've got um, Netta Vital as well. Come on, my cheap. Well, it should, last time I bought that, I said, yeah. But because it's so light as a leaf flower, you can get a good amount of it for a good reasonable price. And bathing it. Yeah, and this will just have a whole body effect. It's even mm -hmm. effect to do this periodically. Yeah, and also when we're taking these approach, we I don't think we can be complacent in the sense that when we really have to look at what's going on, it, it is it is warfare. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It is warfare, and the problem with warfare when you don't know you're in the war. I'm telling you, <laughs> you're just there for the slaughter. It's like the silent war, you know, the bombs that fall, but you don't see them fall. The buildings that drop, but you don't see them drop because they yeah. drop within you. Yeah. And it's spiritual in a sense where, you know, humanity, we're going through the shift. 
you know, and everything's coming out now in the sense of we're becoming more aware. And now we it's like we have to do something with that awareness. Mm. And then that, that's a personal battle, you know. I think the main it's thing from what you say there of with this awareness as humanity is going through this transformation and we are aware of energy and the way energy impacts the world around us through frequency and our thought. It's this energy and this idea of when we are engaging with others, that we're not just in a taking scenario, what we can get from that person there, what we can draw from their body or from their from them, or try to direct and control and manipulate their desires or their thoughts or lead them. Mm. To take it's like to build energy, the idea of projecting out a thought out of well, either compassion, love. And this this concept there, or out of a, a no place state, which is a harder place to manifest. But from this place here, having an interaction with another person, and through that interaction there, bouncing energy back and forth through my humanity evolution, through frequency vibration, I have a conversation with somebody, and then they expand the thought, or they take it on, and then they open up and they send that energy back to me. And I receive and I expand the thought and I open up and I send the energy back to them. In this mm. expansion, then through that, it's like a whole field starts to grow. Mm. This is when it feels good when you're in a space of people. When you're in a space where people are taken from you, then it's a different thing. It's like your energy is becoming sucked out while the other space is growing. Their field is expanding. And we have less energy, less voltage activity going on. Evolution of humanity, because we are able to manipulate frequency and vibration through thought and through words, or we keep on saying, this is what needs to be controlled, understood, mastered. The next step of humanity's evolution is right in our presence, right with us. We miss it, but we're going to see, we're going to see we're seeing it now. Mm, Christos? Mm. Expansion. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's, it's, it's profound. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> me, them thing is like, um, you go through the world and you just see take, take, take. You just see control. You just see um, constant retraction of energy. You, can't, you see a constant taking. Uh, and as a result, this just seems to be more emotional stress. Mm. I'm not listening. No, I'm not hearing. No, I'm not hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this pow power chip. Yeah. You're the power imbalance. Yeah. And where you see the oppressed, and I'm not talking about oppressed people, I'm just, everyone's oppressed in society, if I'm talking about in that sense. But mm. we see oppressed people oppressing other people. Oh dear! And, and all they need to do is find themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more you examine this, you, it's, it, it, it is interesting. You know, even where I was working earlier today, <laughs> it's just I was seeing a lot of power. Power tripping, and even in a situation where nothing needs to be said, exertion of dominance over someone just to be seen to be dominant. Mm. And then we, we approach this with food as well, always dominating whether it's animals or dominating our ability to be able to buy food or a certain food, so we buy the food, just because we can. It's true. You know, That's you know. a one, isn't it? Just because, just because we can. Hmm. Hmm. Whereas you know, when we're looking at even the food crisis or the money crisis out there, if there's anything that the money crisis should have taught you is actually you don't need to eat some of the junk we're eating. It's true, because them thing they were scarce. <laughs> for a good time, mm -mm. we have to change our dietary habit. But yeah. look how quick that one there can just go back to normal. 
Like mm. he was never in that experience there. But many of us did it all on. It's probably true, you know. I swear back that those probably did stay open. Yeah. And I think a few others did as well. <laughs> but they played the empty. All right. <laughs> Is there any other um any other queries? Christos, anything else going on there before we um leave the family with our um mm-hmm. overview of how to readdress the irritation that affects us? I think I would like to say that I think we're all thinking backwards in the foods that we have been eating, even in our in our um, ethic in in our own food as Caribbean people, and we probably have been irritated for a long time, but not not really take it on board. I think we're all really thinking about this because it's the second time order has spoken, and then. Um, <sighs> There's nothing to ask her because she's given us the answers. That's right. It's true. The awareness that we've been given now. But I miss saying thank you to her anyway. I thought she was going to stay a bit longer. She yeah. had to go. She, she enjoys coming on here. <laughs> oh, so I hope she doesn't take a front that because we hadn't said anything it's just because she's spoken before and I think most of us have been on that talk already and it's just reaffirming that information in different ways through whether it's the stools or if it's um um the immune system it's all coming into a circle of understanding right it's true that is what's important how it all connects the dots are all coming together that's a, a deep level of clarity of your own body and what can yeah. be done? Yeah. No, no, it's an interesting point because you know there's only one truth. So the truth should sound like the truth, and the truth should sound similar to other truths. So even with this order talking about the gut, you know, you can see where so you can easily link it up with the metaphysics and some of the, the tales of the ancient one. You know, it doesn't matter what perspective you hear it from, it still sounds similar. Yeah. When we're really looking within ourselves, we it feels similar. So, you know, I don't think there's a part of us that already knew this information. Yes. And that part of us that already knew is the part that... In, in denial. <laughs> <laughs> they're in denial that's what we're battling against isn't it this is why we have to have this conversation of the amygdala and, and this is why these conversations socially on this type of forum is helpful because it reaffirms thoughts and you can delve into it a bit more when you're on subconscious yeah. whereas when you're given the information you go to the GP or if you go to the library it sits on the surface yeah. You know, but having it reaffirmed in our own community, it's it is a good time for us to really think, because we're already being oppressed. Um, there's going to be more stresses to come in the future, and if if we're physically vulnerable, then that it makes it more difficult to deal with those pressures we're going to be receiving. Yeah, and even though there's more stresses, doesn't mean we have to be yeah. stressed. Yeah, yeah, because. It's not going to be a pretty journey in the next few years. I can't see things are going to get any better. Yeah. We can only make this um, the improvements internally. Yeah. In the world from within. Yes. Yeah. Introspection, because we're always thinking internally. But it's what, what force are we having internal? Yeah, yeah. But I do like the point you brought up about denial. That's the internal. You would, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a really important word. I yeah. think we do that a lot, and and it's because of the society we live in and the choices we we that is available to us, hmm. and convenience and all sorts. But there's all so many different factors. Yeah, but we can we can try and do a little bit at a time correct and tweet where we can that's right because it's a journey 
change <laughs> one product, but you've right. changed that product. And that's one that you didn't do yesterday. Hmm. You see, I'm learning. Enjoy the journey, isn't it? Hmm. Enjoy the journey. But the journey. What does everybody else have to say? Yeah. <laughs> The journey's not uh, for the swift. So we've got um, Didi, very true, especially a specialist who recently told me I have to eat meat as a protein. It's better for healing in autoimmune diseases, I think. But this didn't sit well with me. So even the information you're receiving from the specialist because we should all be specialists on our body. We should be more specialists than any other specialist. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, the fact that it didn't sit well is, it's not resonating, you know. And that resonate, when things are not resonating with you, then, you know, it's a little bit off the truth. But no, um, Vanessa said, thank you, Helen, for sharing that. Um, Oh, Vanessa raised her hand. Uh, Vanessa, go on. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, similar to what Dee Dee said about the specialist, I had one who um, said, don't change your diet, just keep taking the blood, um, doing blood tests. And, you know, when I spoke to you, Christos, today, I just thought, you know, this just isn't right. So it's been really helpful. I'm sorry I missed the beginning when Audra spoke. I just couldn't get in, but um, hopefully I can get a chance to um, hear her talk again. Yeah, or catch the replay. But it's, okay, it's, yes. From a, a naturopath point of view, I'm not a naturopath. I've only um, engaged with them through conversation and asked them and uh, read their literature. But from their point of view, there is a time that um, certain meats are required to eat to bring a balance to the body. Mm. So it's, a, so it's a thing where, in that case, it would be good to have a conversation with a naturopath. Because mm. um, and the only naturopath I've properly actually studied is Dr. Lalela Africa. And then he shows that depending upon certain conditions, you, um, you have the vitamin option, you have the, um, the, the fruit, the vegetable, the root, the um the, the like the artificial or the, the the artificial chemical created um pharmaceutical option vitamin c whatever it is or vitamin d and then you have like the different meats whether it be liver the kidneys or whatever so when you look through his book it shows different um options and for some people they could they digest different types i'm not saying that that's really an option for you i'm just expanding your awareness to say that depending actually there is a there is a reason we would literally be looking into that one a bit deeper. Yeah. <laughs> but also, yeah. as Christos said, follow your gut, as we're talking about here anyway. But sometimes <laughs> we follow our gut without a deeper understanding or without an understanding of a bigger picture here. Mm -hmm. Just giving you a bigger picture. And I think that's where I've kind of not had that information and that knowledge, because like some of the stuff that you've spoken about today, the enteric, I had no idea what that was. So that's really kind of given me some good information so I can go away and look up a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Didi, uh, yes, please speak. You, you're raising your hand. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was really good. Um, yeah, I just wanted to explain my comment because... Okay. Um, it was to do with looking at, she was talking that she's an autoimmune specialist. And, you know, I said, I've given up meat and fish. And she's like, no, you need to have that every day. And obviously where I've made the journey to give it up, to be told you have to have it. Um, I wasn't sure as well, because I was looking at it also from a black perspective. I was like, is that actually right? You know, because it's maybe right for her in her experience, but is that necessarily right for me? But um, it's not something I had come across because she had said the proteins in meat are better for healing. And that's that's what I queried. Like I hadn't heard that before. So I was, yeah. So I'm still on that journey of finding out if that's actually the case. 
that um and, and then when she made the comment um she was looking at um your did she look at your date specifically and kind of your whatever you was going through did she take these things into consideration or was it just like a general no yeah we had quite a long uh, you know, I sent her a lot of my details and we had a long sort of session, did some blood tests and stuff. But um, yeah, it's just. And was she able to give you the reason why or explain to you why? About the. Well, she just said the proteins, you know, because obviously I'm trying, you know, I've got a more sort of vegetarian diet at the moment. And she said those proteins aren't as strong or effective like she said you need a higher dose of she said you need high protein low carb uh low fat diet to help with any autoimmune disorders and she said the protein in meat is different from that of yeah. you know where you get yeah. it can can I say, sure. yeah. yeah yeah go for it okay can i say i have an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. and I find if I go um, on the vegetarian journey, my well-being was not the same. And also my body told me when I needed to have um, protein such as red meat, i.e. Um, something like beef. And then I will introduce liver sometimes into my diet as well. Um, so for me, I've noticed this, there is a difference. I mainly eat chicken but the chicken doesn't have the same, it doesn't give me the vitality. There's, mm. I don't know what it is, but that's, I've had autoimmune since I was in my early 20s. So it's been a very long time. And um, this is what I found in, with food. Also, I think we also could be allergic to certain medications as well. If we've got autoimmune illnesses I think there could be an allergy as well to the medication they would like to give you and if you can go the holistic way and monitor if you have been taking it um see how you get on because I really think there's a lot of things they don't talk about with immune diseases yeah and they leave you to go on the journey on your own but when they do start talking it's all it's all in quotation marks and it may have worked for one person but what was that person who was that person where did they come from in what's you know their background so it went all different mm. so the meat may be a factor because I know that when I've tried to come off meat in the past or try to have that really holistic eating method um, I have to reintroduce some kind of protein and that was many years ago because I actually removed a lot of foods from my diet and reintroduced them in my early years of having lupus mm -hmm. when I first found out I, I stripped everything from orange juice I used to make my own orange juice my own pizzas everything was handmade and I had a massive freezer where somebody was able to go in there and have a feast every time they came from school because everything was handmade <laughs> yes, <there is. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about me <laughs> yeah so so I spent a lot of time in the kitchen just doing that then I started to reintroduce um and that's when I started to use sunflower oil then because that was the only oil that I could work with mm. and that's a very over 40 years ago so you know yeah oh. no thank you I appreciate that so just do your research. Look at how you feel when you eat certain foods. Mm. It's, so it's really about the gut, isn't it? Because we just learned that what I'm talking about is how I react in my gut and how my body feels after it's gone through my gut. Mm. And from this. But I do have to have it at least once a month. I will have a red meat at least once a month. Mm. And I think nutritionally, what we're getting from this is definitely this vitamin B, um, v, uh, vitamin B, mm -hmm. vitamin B and amino acids. Mm -hmm. mm, I think these are the things that we, because amino acids, they say the building blocks of life. Mm -hmm. And we're taking this from another living source, um, yeah. source or physical source. And then 
this um, vitamin B, which when we go into a health or let's say a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle, um, our vitamin B intake and folate intake drops dramatically. And that can mm. cause a whole host of ailments and issues. Mm. And I think that's probably the major thing going on, you know, when we're talking about eating meat here. And then, because even like, it's interesting because base, when you're look, looking at experience, you're looking at m a little bit more than what the textbooks are saying. Yeah. And when you, for example, when we've got certain explanations, sometimes they're very difficult for healthcare professionals to really explain what's really going on. Mm. And a lot of the reason problem for that is sometimes because they may have not gone through a journey. And that's why the practitioners or therapists or holistic health experts, the real best ones are sometimes not even the ones who are so academic, mm -hmm. but they're the ones that have been through an experience and they're able to draw from the experience and um, correlate that to the research and, you know, kind of make sense from it. Because, you know, when and this is why we have to relearn everything. Literally. We're looking at the words of what something is in a book. It's totally different from what something is in reality. Mm. And proteins have been a very interesting one for myself, you know, because I've been a vegan for a, a long time now. And the way I'm able to work and the way I'm able to exercise, you know, is a very, you know, it's an abundance, you know, I can, the endurance is a lot. Hmm. And it doesn't correlate with, oh, when people say, where do I get my protein? And I'm looking at the ones eating protein and I'm like, where you get your protein from? <laughs> because you know, you're finished. I've been up since, you know, five o'clock and I'm still eating. But that's you know, the side of the story we hear a lot, the overconsumption. Because mm -hmm. mum talking about it from like a medical approach. Yes, 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 of course, of mm -hmm. course. But, it's but that's, And then it relates to different body types as well. Mm. You know, and different, you know, realities, different perception, because, you know, obviously, you know, when we're seeing a lot of sisters anyway, we're seeing a huge deficiency in iron. Yeah. You know, and then that could have a part to play where, you know, sometimes just the, the red meat and stuff like that, yeah. where it helps with the replenishment because, you know, I would say just from talking to people, I think I've seen more, it seems, I might not be uh, right, but this is just from my limited experience, I've seen more detrimental effects in females Hmm. completely coming up being strict vegans but then I would see that same type of um, extremities in over exercising hmm. you know, where I would see women in their maybe 60s or coming up to their 60s who's been doing pure exercises hmm. and they seem to be almost riddled with arthritis you know, so there's so many factors, and I think all these factors are based on what we really understand about the human body. Yeah, and that's all dominating, it seems like, from thought and thinking. Enough of us are running from something, you know, running from something to go and do something else, but haven't even spent a moment. Mm. And that's really resolved them inner things there. The same arthritis and joint pain. It's trying to find um, an activity and a movement that we really enjoy and taking time because I know what you mean and I've observed that as well and I would say it's an over um it's an over it's an over um putting um the over balance hmm. over compensating but compensating for something else isn't it yeah 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 for rest Christos yeah yeah for rest and I noticed that there's enough in the older age they don't rest you know that the older mm. women, as for a moment, just women for a moment, the older, the more active they become, the more going out or doing stuff or they're in retirement stage and there's not calm, serenity. 
and we're just going to walk through the park. We're talking about we're going to go and um, go and do stuff, go shopping. There's not even a thing really. Um, go to the market. There's not even a thing with family and stuff there. It's just like only oh, yeah, up and down, up and down. That's the thing. Yeah, that's a funny thing, and I think that's the emotional connection when you when you go into that. As we've spoken already today, that's, that's a, and it leads me to something else that will take us into another a whole different thing. But I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say this, yeah, because this is how I look at this. What you say there, you triggered me. Don't get me excited. It's you. I call this the um, the suffering, the suffering goddess. It's like the the um the suffering goddess, the, the the female, the woman who goes through 40, 50, 60, 70, I'm talking about sometimes from 10, 15 years old, maybe younger, let's say 20, to their 70, 80, 90, and they go through a whole life of trauma, a whole life of suffering, a whole life of pain, a whole life of irritation. And because of that, they're always on the go. They're always running somewhere. They're always moving. Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've, I've labeled that one there, the, the, the suffering goddess. Because I see this one come up in so much mythology as well, that you think, say, we're just making it up because of what we see in this reality here. Now, but this is a thing that's replayed. That's why you get me started, because I've just seen it replayed now and in ancient texts. Yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. Right, so I think we'll come to an end today then. Uh, well, glad to see everyone still with us to the end. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> and is there any, any, any more comments before we... Before we um... yeah, yeah. I wanted to say something. The yes, suffering so... goddess. You just come, Shirley, you just join us. No, I've been listening for a while. I was a little bit late because you know, <laughs> I this. it was my son's birthday today. And yeah. because... I, I am the suffering goddess. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so busy that I, I completely, yesterday I remembered my goodness is his birthday. But, you know, I've got builders in and I'm doing other things. So, um, I, and he called me, so I couldn't say, well, look, you know, I'm listening to Zoom now because his mother forgot his birthday. Oh. So I turned it around. And I said, I should be getting the happy birthday calls and I should be getting the cards and the flowers. Because... It's true. It's true. <laughs> My mom can hold testament to that because it's true. On, on our, yeah. on, on them day, they acknowledge mom. Yeah, <laughs> you agreed with me, actually. So, yes, you were talking about the, I felt I had to come in there, the suffering goddess. <laughs> so many elders. The ones in oh, there. I'm always on the go. I'm always on the go. So, but you know, thank God I am healthy. Um, I had I had a prolapse um, pelvic floor from lifting the heavy um, sometimes I didn't know how to how to close some of the buggies, you know, they're so complicated, my <laughs> grandchildren and taking them here and then, mm -hmm. you know, and um, my husband is not a hands-on person, but I'm very hands-on lifting heavy things. And I think this is what caused the prolapse but otherwise i must say i am very healthy good 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 and and surely with, with your your friendship group do you see a lot of other suffering goddesses in your circle in my friendship um or just there's only one i know of and she's much younger but mm. i don't know for how long she's had the arthritis, you know, hips and um, and mm -hmm. knees, and um, I have my my husband's niece, who is about our age. She was she's about two years younger. She's passed on now, and I think it's from the medication that she was on that she developed, you know, the side effects, and she had a hip replacement and mm -hmm. um, a knee replacement. The knee replacement didn't do very well. She went on to get um, um, methicillin resistance stuff, or MRSA, and um, she passed away at 68. Sadly, lovely, lovely, lovely girl. 
Um, I don't see that many. We we go out, we socialize. I have been a vegetarian really for the past 30, 30 odd years. My daughter started when she was three years old. She said, oh, dead animals. I don't want to eat it. So, you know, I so then, you know, I decided not to not to give her any meat. And up to today, I mean, you've seen her when we came to the weekender tall and you know good height and she looks she's very healthy so the um being a vegetarian has not caused any problems um i had fibroids and um because i suppose i had a hysterectomy and this is what precipitated i suppose the pelvic prolapse um apart from that we are pretty Thank God, healthy, and that's my affirmations every day. <laughs> I've got perfect health. I'm um, perfect health, <laughs> mind, body, and um, soul. You know, and um, I, I don't go to the gym. I don't go to the gym, but I exercise at home, as you know. <laughs> so I do some exercises with you. Yeah, and um, I do some exercises. I do some tai chi, and you know, but. Being always on the go, yes, I go walking. I should go more often. Sometimes I go often, but it doesn't happen all the time. I um, I go walking with a group of friends. Well, you would, yeah, no, the circle of friends that I walk with. There are two ladies who, yeah, have back problems and knee problems, but they're not melanated people, if you understand what I mean. Um, we only two melanated ones. And um, we're pretty, pretty fit. So the question would be, because you're discussing here before, we, yeah, we're discussing physical fitness and physical well-being. Let's for a moment shift to emotional and mental. So yeah. the question would be then the idea of going and sitting alone in the park for a moment and sitting still and listening to the birds and breathing. Just yeah. be still for a moment, not being with somebody, you know, going um, for a walk along a stream on your own and just emptying out your thoughts. It's that now, those moments, if you're in those moments and it's hard to disconnect, um, people keep on coming up, events keep on coming up, places keep on coming up, emotions keep on coming up because it's only in those moments you get an opportunity for the introspection. When you're with friends or with a group or with family or in a group, you may reflect, but your reflection is only within the space of a few seconds or a few minutes of silence or through the space of the conversation. So then emotions yeah. don't really dwell the same way. So the question is now that we're looking at emotional and mental well-being and health. Yes. Yeah. So are we engaging in I've those? Been meditating. I yeah. have been meditating and, since 1986. I've been meditating. Yes, I am follower spiritual path, and that's why I've got that strong connection to that's you. Why, <laughs> that's why you can keep it going so strong. It's, 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 it's that yeah. balance. Strong connection. Yeah. Yeah. And Every day. Everybody. You say you've been doing it from Pardon? the 80s. You've been doing it from the 80s. Oh, yeah, for 30, 30 odd years. Well, it's 33, it's 30, 30. Mm. Since 1986, yes, I learned. Yes. And like um, I learned different forms of meditation and breathing. I was exercises as well. I do a lot of breath work. This is it. Yeah. This is what I think has caused you to um, maintain balance. Because a lot mm. of the women that I know who go through this experience here, and I've had such experiences. It's it's the um through their ailment, it's it's what you've described there that keep them in in harmony. But that mm. harmony is such a thin line. It's like being on a fence. It's, you can just drop either way. And it's this thought every day that you're maintaining that keeps you just like humpty dumpty, isn't it? Humpty dumpty. <laughs> like, you, but you don't want to fall left or you don't want to fall right. You just want to be filled with all the chi in the middle. Yes. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty is deep yeah. and really <laughs> uh, Thank yes. you, Shirley. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I love you both. I love, I do. I was saying to my son when he called just now, I said, look, you used to listen to this too every day, all the time. He said, mom, you still listen to this? Yes. He's a physio, he but, you know, that, but he needs to be with you too, to learn. Mm -hmm. To send learn, him, but I said, he's got a long way to go. To catch up with you. Yeah. Bring him, bring him in gradually, as we say. Yeah. With subtle words. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. Appreciated. Well, I, think I never stop learning. I never stop learning. For me, what I know is like, oh, you're going to put on a pinhead. <laughs> <laughs> it's always something new. Yeah, and that's expansion and growth, isn't it? That means... Yeah. We're always expanding, but we have to be also able to um, empty, mm. empty yes. and fill, empty and fill. We have yes. to fill up, empty out. Yeah, that is the true alchemy science. There, letting go of stuff. Uh, all right, I think so. Anyone else? I think we're we're um. Going Thank to you. Meet everyone. Thank back. you. Have a good night, guys. Right. Good night. All right. Thank, thank you, everybody. Care. We shall catch you in two weeks with um with with Leon, and we're going to be going through um the, the electric. Uh, what are we going through again? Voltage is health. Vo vo if there's so many ways we can tie it to it. <laughs> Healing in voltage, electro, electric <laughs> well, the universe. Yeah, it's true. We're going to go into this universal stuff again, this electric stuff, and tie this all back in, <laughs> back to the body. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, night, morning, wherever you are in the reality of this world. Yeah, I will see you soon. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye.